everyone knows Emma Frost's diamond form, but did you know this wasn't the first ever secondary mutation to even appear in the comics? What? This secondary mutation is an interesting one for me, as I didn't know about it myself. I've never been deep in the know when it comes to Elixir, so it was cool to find out that something I thought was just a core part of his standard mutation is actually perhaps secondary. For this point, we're talking about Elixir's physical mutation, the golden hue of his skin. This change occurred shortly after his first appearance. Only a few issues later, he actually uses his powers to heal himself and his skin changes to a golden color. So it seems to make sense that I wouldn't know this was even a secondary mutation since most of his appearances have been with this look. Joshua Foley, aka Elixir's skin, also changes color when he uses his powers to harm others, changing from a golden hue to a deep metallic black color. The changing of his skin is not something that Elixir also seems to be able to control, but instead is a mutation that is closely tied to his primary healing and death touch abilities. If your skin changed color anytime you did anything, what would you definitely want it to be or not want it to be? While many heroes have secondary mutations, let's not forget that this whole idea in terms of when it was classified started with Emma Frost, who herself was once a famous villain. Likewise, there have been other villains who have also gained a secondary mutation, but who simply aren't as well known. Enter Black Tom Cassidy, a classic mutant villain, and if you aren't familiar with him, you should be, he's pretty cool. His secondary mutation has changed somewhat throughout his history. It's been described as giving him the upgraded ability to channel his bio blast through his fists, as opposed to needing wood to channel said blast, which is what he originally had, giving him his own plant form, and giving him the power to manipulate plants and wood around him. Like many others on our list, Black Tom actually got this sort of secondary mutation from being mortally wounded, but yeah, it's changed a lot throughout the years in terms of exactly how it works or what it does. It feels weird to include Beast also on this list, but when I think about most people I know who love the X-Men, they usually always think of Beast as being default blue. Now this is because most of the people I know grew up with the 90s or early 2000s Beast after he'd undergone his secondary mutation. Many fans out there still don't know that Beast's original power set was just that he was like super dexterous. He just looked like a guy. He had big feet, big hands, and he swung around a lot. Initially, Beast looked like this guy, but after being exposed to a serum he created, which isolates and boosts the X gene in mutants, he became permanently mutated again, gaining the secondary mutation of the blue fur. In fact, I think Beast may be the first mutant in comics to have developed a secondary mutation, before we even had a terminology for it at that time. He mutated. He's all covered in blue fur, which initially was actually like a gray fur, but that's a whole other story. That has to do with comics coloring and miscommunications and just how blues and blacks got often mixed up by people. With this next one, we're not talking about that time that Kitty Pride was turned into a cat person in Wondagore, although that was a thing that happened. It was something though that she was given as opposed to an evolution of her mutant based abilities, and it was temporary. With Kitty, or Kate, it's interesting as there are a few different instances where I feel one could argue that she manifested some kind kind of secondary mutation, or more specifically, evolution of her powers. But this has also, I don't believe, ever fully been confirmed in the comics. Let me know if I miss something and if there is a page where someone says, this is a secondary mutation. <laughs> I'd like to focus on the heightening of her powers over the years, which I believe is the version of a secondary mutation, as I understand what secondary mutations are, which can either be a significant power boost, or it can be something additional. Some people, however, see secondary mutations as just something new and concrete added to a mutant's power set like Emma Frost diamond form, which exists separate from her telepathy, but it doesn't need to be that. And in fact, I think a major power boost does count, hence why I'm counting it. And if you don't agree, we can debate about it in the comments. Like when Kitty stopped needing to hold her breath while intangible, or when she was merged with the Black Vortex, becoming all powerful, but then after giving up the Black Vortex's power, discovered that she had unlocked a new level of power through that. So after you Using it, it was kind of like an additional mutation. As I said, there are actually multiple moments for Kitty when I feel like this has happened, but those are the main ones that come to my mind. Speaking of folks who have seen major power boosts throughout the 
years, enter Bobby Drake, aka Iceman. Iceman has had a few different moments like Kitty Pride, where I would say his powers have evolved and which could be considered a secondary mutation as he severely leveled up. When he learned he could manipulate his body into more than just ice or snow and learn to use his water form. When he learned he could just become straight up ice. That was a whole thing because before he was I believe covered in it. When he healed back up after having his ice form shattered. And when he learned he could make ice clones. Honestly, Bobby's just had a lot of moments because he's super OP. Sink developed a pretty powerful secondary mutation after he returned from the dead during the Krakoan era. So this is a recent one. So you might not know if you're not following with modern comics, or maybe you are and you're like, oh my gosh, this is the one I do know. His secondary mutation is more suspected, I would say, than confirmed. Well, we know he has this ability now, but we don't necessarily know if it is a secondary mutation or not. The ability in question is that he can now remain synced with other mutants even without being near them. I believe the idea is if he's synced with you once, he can kind of sync with you whenever, but of course there are some limits to this and we're still kind of figuring out how that works. I don't think that sync using those powers if you're not near him would be as powerful. However, this mutation also takes a toll on his body and it seems to age him faster every time he uses it. In addition to this, he can also sync with superpowered non-mutants as well, which is huge. As I said, the full extent of his newfound abilities has not been explored and I don't know if everyone would consider them to be a secondary mutation, as they're still tied to the same power set, but I personally do. I believe secondary mutations can also manifest in a boost to a predetermined power set, and I think this should count. To me, it's a secondary mutation, so there you go. Take it or leave it. Cypher is another hero who went from being kind of lame to kind of insanely powerful thanks to his own secondary mutation. Honestly, I've become a pretty big Doug fan in recent years, now that I better understand just how powerful his power set can be. I think my love of Doug comes from me also realizing just as a person how important communication is in my everyday life and how much I value being around other people who can communicate well and also value my ability to communicate with them. When we can't understand each other, it actually creates big problems in our lives. And that's what I appreciate about Doug and his power set. His ability to communicate and through that resolve so many issues without even needing to come to blows. In terms of his mutation, we saw him go from a character who could just understand all languages and communicate with people in that way to someone who really understood the various minute types of languages around us that often go unnoticed and thereby become a master of those types of languages as well. Things like technology and even at one point physically fighting which is a sort of physical communication or language and dance. This shift in his abilities happened after Doug died and was resurrected and it honestly puts him on a whole other level and really he's pretty powerful. I know sometimes we say oh communicating is that powerful? Actually it is. <laughs> I always forget about Kid Omega's secondary mutation because it just very rarely comes up in the comics anymore. Probably because Quentin Quire no longer finds it interesting. At least that's the canon reason that we were given for this. Though I personally think it sounds super interesting and I am surprised that he is bored of it. However, this is Quentin so maybe I shouldn't be so surprised. He is often unimpressed by some of the coolest stuff or at least he presents himself this way often. Kid Omega's secondary mutation here is a non-corporeal form which when accessed also speeds up his consciousness and allows him as a telepath to reach out and connect with all sentient beings. He can think at the speed of light while in this form, but then again, even when Quire isn't in it, he is known for being one of the fastest thinkers and one of the smartest psionics on the planet. Maybe that's why he was like, eh, it's all right. I become like whatever, I don't have a physical form, but like I'm pretty cool even when I have a physical form. Said to be the daughter of Unis the Untouchable, one of the earliest X-Men villains, Carmella's mutant power set is similar to her father's. However, at one point her powers evolved even beyond her own control. This seems to be a result of being exposed to Mother Vine, which triggered a secondary mutation in her. This mutation would cause her energy field to overcharge the more she used it, making it more devastating in terms of the damage it did to the people and technology around her. And if you aren't familiar with Unis the Untouchable, his main thing was that you couldn't touch him because he had a field around him that made it impossible to touch him. But this is also a field that blasts out in Carmela's case as well. What was worse, she had no control really over the power of her energy field and she also suffered as a result thanks to overcharge resulting in a backlash so when it happened she would also be in pain as well so she'd be causing pain to others and then also be like ow I mean I mean she I know she's like a villain normally but still sucks you know that would suck whether you're a villain or not something about people being in near-death experiences that seemingly allows them to evolve out of survival mask is another one of those mutants and mask was inherently more of a villain in the
in the comics, and also a Morlock. However, being a Morlock wasn't what made him evil, because Morlocks are not inherently evil. What made him evil was his outlook on life. His mutant powers allowed him to alter the appearance of others, basically turning him into one of the world's most powerful plastic surgeons. But at the same time, Mask was considered himself to be hideous, hence why he hid in the underground tunnels of New York with the Morlocks and usually led them. And his powers did not work on his own physical appearance. That is, until he was killed by Shatterstar. To survive, he had to move his organs around, and this actually unlocked the power within him to manipulate his own appearance. For a while, he actually used his powers to appear as Marilyn Monroe, no I'm not kidding, while leading the Morlocks. Although now Mask has seemingly gotten over his obsession with beauty and chooses to mostly appear just as he is. A friendly reminder to love yourself, friends. Take a page out of Mask's book. Actually, I th I, at least I think that's what happened to him. I, I don't know. I'm, I haven't read every single Mask issue, so. But I, if there isn't a Mask issue where he realizes, you know what, maybe I should love myself as I am, there should be one. And if there isn't, Marvel, if you need someone to write it, I'll write it for you. That's about it. I'm your host, Amanda McKnight, and until next time, you stay nerdy, YouTube. Bye.